Good day. We're here to discuss our first Advent Bible class, and I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Please join me. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins, and saved by your mighty deliverance, for you live and you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So our first discussion for, to for today is around Jesse, the seed of Jesse's tree. And we're going to be referencing in particular some text from Genesis and Romans. And it's in the guide that we will have posted with this. But I'll have you just have you queue up Genesis 127, Genesis 3, 8 to 15, and Romans 5, 12 to 21. Now, saying that, we're going to be cross-referencing several other texts uh, within our Gospels here today as we go through some of our Bible discussion. So Advent this year starts out where we form our discussion around the coming of Christ related, related to him being the seed of the King of David, who was the son of Jesse. So our first Advent is Jesus, the seed of Jesse's tree, because it is from Jesse that the King David came and Jesus from the lineage of David. We then go on to Jesus, the root of Jesse's tree, Jesus, the life of Jesse's tree. And finally, on the week of Christmas, it'll be Jesus, the first fruit of Jesse's tree. So we really begin our story where we reference all the way back to creation, when God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. And from Adam's side, from a rib, he formed Eve. And how bright a world it must have been at that point in time in creation in the Garden of Eden, where Adam, Eve, and God were in unison, in harmony, in, I guess, a right relationship or righteousness, if you would say. This infant, Jesus, after Adam's fall, Jesus came. He came as a human in the horror of humanity's fall into sin, into death and darkness. And that's the miracle, of course, of Christmas, that a human, through a Virgin Mary, the actual descendant of Eve and Adam, would bring our Lord into human form and his light into the light of the world to reverse the darkness that was brought on by sin. So with that, let's go to our first question. And it is Jesse, the father of David in our discussion guide. He appears in genealogies of Jesus given both in Matthew 1, 1 to 17, and Luke 3, 23 to 38. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be going through several related passages here. So this is just linking us back to Jesus's human linkage. And what you're going to find here, and what I'm asking is, what emphasis does each of these evangelists make in structuring his genealogy in different ways? Now I'm going to open up the scripture here and I'm going to first go to Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and just draw a few highlights. Matthew is speaking here to both a Jew and a Gentile audience. And he, however, is trying to position throughout his gospel that Jesus is the son of David, the true king of Israel, fulfilling God's dealings with his people in the Old Testament. So he's trying to tie it back to the Old Testament and link Jesus to being the son of David, the messianic prophecy. So that bears true now in his genealogy as he starts out with Abraham and then he moves to David. But let's just, let me read just the beginning. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Note Matthew's emphasis, the son of Abraham. And then he goes, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. But as he goes down farther, he also connects Jesus' lineage to key women in the history of our Lord. And for one, I'd like to point out, it's Simon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Notice that he highlights Rahab. Rahab was a pagan at the time before she became a follower of the Lord. And she was actually a prostitute that worked with the children of Israel as they crossed the Jordan River to go in the land of Canaan and really became like a spy. But God used her and God brought her to himself and from her came the lineage of David and our Christ. So it goes through with various examples. Ruth, who married 
Obed, who was, um, or Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. So it, it speaks to Ruth, who also had a role in the lineage of our Lord. So more of the females that were part of this lineage are highlighted in Matthew's narrative. And again, he begins with a focus on Abraham and then works forward in time. Now if we go to Luke, and let me find the passage again, it's Luke 3, 23 to 28. So let me turn to Luke here. And what you're going to find in Luke, that his genealogy begins in reverse order. It starts with Joseph, his human father. And his human, really, stepfather, you could say, since he was really incarnate of the Holy Ghost by the Virgin Mary, as you know. But it begins with Joseph, and then it backs all the way through, all the way back to Adam. And what I think is unique in making the tie, whereas Matthew emphasizes Jesus as the son of David, and certainly during his gospel he brings in that the son of David is, has a human nature, he also highlights his divine nature. Luke starts out really with the human lineage, and he's speaking maybe to a little more of a Gentile audience in his case. But what he ends with is that the son of Adam, who was the son of God, and notice the parallel. The first Adam, as Luther often references, who fell into sin, is replaced by the second Adam, who is sinless. The Son of God, who was just a man, and the Son of God, who was both God and man, Jesus Christ. So it's, it's quite a parallel there, and an interesting contrast in the genealogies and the different emphasis. So if we look again at Matthew, he goes from Abraham to David in 14 generations specifically, from David to the deportation of the children that were in Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, to Babylon, and then the deportation to Babylon to Christ. So it's just inter interesting. Whereas Luke again goes with Adam, the first son of God, and then he takes it all the way uh, he, in reverse order from Joseph you know, down to Adam, excuse me. Now in a transition here as we move on to our next question too, in order to appreciate what really Christ has done for us, we need to understand the original state in the Garden of Eden. And just think how beautiful humanity was at its creation. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. And let's turn now to Genesis 1:27 for a moment. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the image of God, and I think we all have a sense of what that means. Being made in God's likeness in this context is referring in large part that we were set apart, that we were in a right relationship with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the very beginning. But then man fell away and no longer was fully in his image. We did have a will, we did have reason, and so we had some unique characteristics that made us like our creator, but we are created by God, so therefore we are creatures. And so that speaks to our humanity. And after the fall, if we go to Genesis 5, 1 to 5, we have a slightly different contrast. Here it says, in the book of the generations of Adam, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he named them man, collectively, when they were created. When Adam then lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. Now we know there's a contrast here. Originally, we were made fully in the likeness and image of God. Secondly, however, after the fall, then his children, and he's referencing his son Seth because Seth, unlike Cain and Abel, is where the lineage of Jesus originates from. So we started out with fully being in a right relationship, righteous, holy, um, separated, uh, not separated from God, but separated from any sense of evil or darkness to 
being really separated from God and unfortunately embracing the dark side of evil. So Genesis 5 demonstrates some continuity with Genesis 1 in that we created man and woman, male and female. But the dramatic change was that the humans lost the full image of God, that full original righteousness being in a right relationship. And they were now inherited a different kind of originality, and that's original sin, and which gets passed on, inherited from generation to generation. So the familiar story of this fall then shows us how Adam and Eve lived in this state as well. And also it conveys what God then conveyed right away in terms of a promise of how he was going to help out mankind. So if we go back to Genesis 3 and we go to Genesis 7, or 3, 7 to 15. just a second here. Then the eyes of both were opened after they ate from the forbidden tree, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. In the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord called to man and said, Where are you? I heard the sound of you in the garden, Adam said, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Well, the man said, Well, the, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. And then, of course, God goes to the woman and says, What is it that you've done? And the woman said, Well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then the Lord, of course, passed on his cursing. Because you've done this to the snake, to the serpent, to the devil, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat. And then the major statement of the promise. And this is called the Proto-Evangelion, which is the first promise of the gospel, our good news. When God says, I will put enmity, hostility, between you the snake, you the devil, and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So collectively he starts out about all of the offspring of the devil and his wicked minions compared to the offspring that come from Adam and Eve collectively. But then he narrows it down to he shall bruise your head. The he he is referencing here is Christ. Christ is to come to step on the head of the devil. And if you happen to watch The Passion of the Christ, there's a scene where the devil is lurking in while Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and asking God to relieve the burden of this stress of the cross from him. And the devil's just waiting there in the background, highlighted by Mel Gibson. And out of the devil's bottom cloths come a snake emerging on the ground toward Christ. Christ has been over kneeling in prayer. The snake crawls over his forearm, he stands up, and he steps on the head of the snake. Now, some have interpreted the first Hebrew word where we have in, we have in our English Standard Version bruise to mean crush. And so crush the head of the snake by Christ, and the snake, or the devil, shall bruise the heel of Christ, meaning a temporary injury like a snake strike. But most right now feel that it's, it's nearly not an issue of whether it's a crush versus a bruise of the head of the snake. It's more that which part of the anatomy gets hammered, the head or the heel, and which is the worst of the blows, it's that to the head. So Christ is forecast, is promised here to crush Satan and crush out evil. So that is at the very beginning of our creation story after the fall of man. So let's go back to Genesis 3, and what does the introduction of sin into the world do to Adam and Eve? Well, it did three things, I think, as you saw. They covered their nakedness with fig leaves in 3, verse 7. They tried to hide from God in 3, 8 to 11, and they did the old blame transfer, right? Adam said it's Eve, Eve said it's a snake, and the snake didn't get a chance to pass on his guilt. Adam indirectly also blames God, the woman you gave me, 
you know, so he sort of puts a little bit also on God as Eve blames Satan. So sinners to this day, when we go to sort of the next part, how does God deal with sin and how do we try to deal with sin today and does this pattern continue? Well, let's just break it apart. So think about this. Um, some think that leading an outwardly righteous life covers our sin just like fig leaves covered their nakedness. That would be salvation by works, which we know is not effective. It doesn't lead us to salvation. Some try to hide from God, as Adam and Eve did in the garden. And we might consider that really a rejection today of God's word, just ignoring God. Thank you very much. I want to go on with my life. God doesn't matter. And then some blame their sin, knowing maybe they do things wrong, but they blame it on external factors or we point the finger to other people, the excuse or the justification of why we mess up in life. But man-made methods of disposing of sins doesn't, as we know, work. Uh, the only thing that takes it away is God's promise that Christ will come and step on the head of the devil and crush the devil, sin, and the sinful nature that we have forever through his death and resurrection.